I got the call from Minneapolis PD saying they wanted the FBI to come out and take a look. Anything slightly freakazoid, that's the drill, call Mo Box. So I shoot on down here to see what's the what. And I'll be damned if I'm not knocked on my butt by what they show me. 22 years I've never seen anything like it. I get one look at the corpse and I'm on the phone to my pal Andy Schneider down at the Mutual UFO Network. You know Andy. No, I don't. Well, he knows you. You think this grave was unearthed by aliens, Agent Fox? Well, it has all the telltale signs, don't you think? I mean, according to the literature. Well, I hate to disappoint you, Agent Fox, but this doesn't look like the work of aliens to me. Discovering the X-Files, the podcast in which a newbie takes a deep dive into the entirety of Chris Carter's universe while longtime fans escort me on the journey, a perilous journey filled with government conspiracies or weird monsters every other week. I'm Eric's Antoine, and today Daniel and I will be discussing Irresistible, which originally aired on January 13th, 1995. It was written by Chris Carter and directed by David Nutter. In this episode, Mulder and Scully investigate a creepy man who is kidnapping and killing women to satisfy a very particular death fetish. Meanwhile, Scully, who is still recovering from her earlier abduction, is overcome with PTSD and becomes very deeply disturbed by this case, more so when the killer personally involves her. It's another serial killer thriller which features Nick Chinland in his first appearance as the creepy villain Donald Faster. Daniel and I will break it down in a moment. Stick around. In med school, you develop a clinical detachment to death. In your FBI training, you are confronted with cases, the most violent and terrible cases, you think you can look into the face of pure evil, and then you find yourself paralyzed by it. You're a very strong person. You've probably always felt you can handle any problem by yourself, but you feel vulnerable now. Is it your partner? Is there a problem with trust? No. I trust him as much as anyone. I trust him with my life. Can you talk to him about the way you're feeling? I don't want him to know how much this is bothering me. I don't want him to feel like he has to protect me. Yeah, so you remember, like, we briefly spoke about the episode uh, before I watched it, and I told you how, like, based on the title, there were two things. I, I was going to unavoidably think of the Robert Palmer song, but beyond that, I thought, oh, I'm gonna. I'm guessing this is one of those, you know, this is gonna have something to do with like a succubi or an incubus or, or you know, one of those, something like that, you know, or so, something in the vein of gender bender where you have this, this being that uh, attracts people. I thought we were gonna get something along those lines, but instead, we got. Uh, we got Nick Chinland as a very, very creepy man. Um, <laughs> it, it just didn't occur to me that they would do another serial killer type story yeah. right after the previous one. And that's not, I mean, it, it makes you wonder if they, if these episodes are produced in the same order that they're aired, or if, if they take that into account when they schedule the episodes. I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. But yeah, they it's between Aubrey and Irresistible, you pretty much have the blueprint for Millennium. <laughs> right, right. I was gonna say, I mean, this one it this one just absolutely doesn't even have anything. I mean, Aubrey at least had that that one little element, that one, you know, borderline supernatural element where you have that genetic connection, you know, you, you have that going on. So yeah. it still had that, but but this one is just a straight up psycho story that treats its subject matter 
with a certain degree of just uh, verisimilitude, you know, right down to having uh, Scully uh, suffering from PTSD. And I mean, I guess the, the reasoning here is that Scully is still, she's still traumatized by her experience, by her abduction earlier in the season. So it makes sense that this uh, lingers to some degree because it's a little bit, I mean, you're, you're taken aback when you see her get so very unsettled by these particular deaths and it happens right away. Like when they first go to the cemetery, they open up the coffin. Well, I mean, they, they see down there, like the, how the, the corpse has been defiled Mm -hmm. and you immediately see that she's extremely disturbed by this. And later when she's looking at the pictures, you know, of of the victims, she's extremely disturbed by them. And like later on when she speaks with her therapist, I don't know if what she, I mean, I understood it as yes, she's still traumatized because of the events, uh, you know, earlier in the season, the, mm-hmm. the whole Dwayne, the Dwayne Barry uh, incident. I figured that that's what it is, but is there more to it than that? Is there something I'm missing? Um, did you read into the back history of the episode any? I only ask because it was originally written that Donnie wasn't just a death fetishist, but he was yes. also a necrophiliac. And I do wonder, given the intensity with which she, with which Jillian Anderson portrays Scully's trauma and disgust and pro- overall problems with this case, I wonder if it was actually shot with the intention of that being an element at play and it was removed in editing instead of just removed at the script level. Right, right. Uh, That's a very good point, because I did look into this a little bit, Mm -hmm. and yes, that's absolutely the case. Uh, Chris Carter was... uh, His concept was that Donnie Faster, uh, that's the guy's name, was (laughs) was a necrophiliac, and this, of course, was summarily and categorically shot down by standards and practices where they were just like, listen, I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know uh, if you realize that this is a mainstream network and this is a primetime show and there's only so much that we can do. So I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think I it's possible that it was shot that way or it's also possible that that's the script he turned in and they were like, listen, no way, no fucking way. But, <laughs> but, you know, then he's like, all right, well, I mean, I do have this story and it's very, you know, I can make it work. I'll just remove all, I'll just remove references of necrophilia from the story, but keep the basic story structure and everything, everything about it exactly the same, except you remove the, because it stands to reason that he is a necrophiliac who yeah. also likes to keep souvenirs also likes to defile the bodies and all of that would still exist within the same story. Mm -hmm. And it would make Scully's particular revulsion much more understandable because the way things are at that point, it does seem like, wow, this is really affecting you, isn't it? You know, because in the end, yeah, of course it's, it's terrible. It's, it's terrible to kill someone. Uh, clearly, he's you know he's he's brutalizing these women, and there is a sexual connection that's implied. Yeah, even the way things are, they they hint at it still in the fact that they bring up more than once the fact that he clearly wants the bodies to be cold before he starts doing whatever he does to them. So yeah. the there's a subtle implication there that. Outwardly, it's that he wants to preserve the hair and nails for, or fingers for his clipping. And that, you know, perhaps it would slow the blood flow with him chopping the digits off. Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that's what I mean. It's. You it's can this infer thing where, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, I think we are meant to sort of, there, there's enough of a connection already made where. It's almost like Chris Carter was like, you know what? Fuck it. And he said, okay, I, I won't actually say the word, but, you know, people will, can, can, can just, you know, they can imagine whatever they want to imagine. And 
they're going to be right. And that's <laughs> that, that's basically what it is. It made me think it makes me think a little bit of the the central fallacy, which is at the heart of the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, franchise, because this is sort of like going, you know, the original uh, Nightmare on Elm Street film back in 84, which is an R rated theatrical feature film. And, you know, as we know, Freddy Krueger is uh, a, a child murderer who escapes justice and the parents of his victims all kind of there, there's a mob of them and they burn him alive and, and so on. And that's that's why he's after revenge. The point is, though, in the Nightmare on Elm Street films, they just refer to him as a child murderer. And they never really make any explicit mention of anything beyond that. And it's always seemed very odd to me because I was like, yeah, but he what? He didn't just kill them. I mean, it was worse than that, wasn't it? I mean, it was the implication is that he's also a child. He, you know, he's also a pedophile. I, and, and I think that that is something that although they never say it, I think it's always been very strongly implied. And I've always found it very strange. I've always found it very odd that an R-rated film didn't go there, you know. And clearly, since they never explicitly went there, it sort of allowed Freddy Krueger to become a... God, how can I say this? It's not the right word, but I mean, cuddly? Like, you know, like... (laughs) We know that as of part three, he basically just became like a... Just a lot more family friendly if you will you know he mm-hmm. he he became much more a thing where you know kids are going to wear freddy krueger masks on halloween and whatever and obviously that would not happen if uh they explicitly referred to fred krueger as a child molester right. you know right. so uh, it would just be like uh you know it, but it just seems naive to me because obviously yeah. yes he is you know what i'm saying i mean what what are you you know well and then on top of that, you know, just like we can infer that Donnie does other things here with the Freddy thing, they're never really specific about how young the children are. We just know yeah. that they're all underage, that he murdered and perhaps did other things with. But he makes a lot of sexual comments and gestures towards the teens he is trying to kill in the yeah. actual films themselves. So one can assume that he's not, aside from the supernatural aspects, he's not really behaving any differently than he would have as a normal guy just killing kids in a non-supernatural fashion. So if he is sexually taunting his victims now that he's a dream demon, odds are pretty high that he did it to the kids before he was killed in the first place. Right, right. So all of that is there. They just... Mm -hmm. It's like they say to themselves, we're not going to say the word, so, okay, we're not going to say the word. And then you go like, all right, but it doesn't really change anything, does it? And so here we are with this X-Files episode that is that is about a necrophiliac, but they refer to him as a death fetishist. Yes. And <laughs> And so there were a couple of things that were a little confusing, because... Okay, so when when Scully is being attacked by him, she sees him as a kind of demonic figure. And there's a scene, you know, and there's that scene where he, even before her eyes, begins to shift, begins yeah. to change shapes. And that was a little strange. And, and I thought to myself, well, since Donnie Faster has not been established as a supernatural being, you say to yourself, okay, well, Scully is obviously experiencing her PTSD. This is how it's manifesting itself. Mm -hmm. But I remember very clearly that in the cold open, or like, you know, in the cold open, right, when the the mortician turns around and sees him standing in the distance, for a split second, he also sees a demonic figure. Yes. So so what's that about? Uh... Hmm. How do I want to approach this? Okay, I'm just going to tackle it head on. Um, if we were looking at it in a pure psychological sense, all of it would make sense if Scully was the only one who sees him that way. Right. It could be passed off as her just being so traumatized by what's going on on top of the Dwayne Berry situation and then on top of the death of her father 
not long before that, and it's just snowballed into her having some sort of uh, stress-induced hallucinations. But the mortician aspect really throws a kink in things because, granted, he only sees it once and for a split second, and he is initially creeped out in the I'm hearing noises in this building and I think I'm the only one here sort of way, but he's nowhere near the level of stress that Scully is at when she sees the same thing. So why does he see it that way? Mm -hmm. In the context of this episode, I don't think Donnie is necessarily meant to be anything other than a weirdo. But we are going to see Donnie again. It's not going to be for a few seasons, but he is one of the few returning characters. Okay, okay, and so... the demonic aspects are made more explicit in the second episode that he is in, which I think oh. is in season six. But it, Okay. Now, I could be wrong. I haven't seen it in a long time. Even then, they don't fully explore it, but I think the visual side of it is used more in that second episode. So basically I think they were just playing around with imagery here. Yeah. And then codified it when they decided to bring him back at a later date. Yeah, okay. I mean I, I can see an aspect of it. There, there, there are two there are two things. On the one hand, you have this story which is not at all a traditional X Files story. No. It is just this once again we have a standard kind of grounded just story of a serial killer essentially is what it is and it's almost like they said but this is the x-files so we got to stick something in there just yeah. this little creepy element that doesn't really make any sense but you know it's a cool visual and it's it, it's in keeping thematically with what we do on this show mm -hmm. which you know somebody who commits this sort of unspeakable evil is of course not a normal human being and yeah. i guess you could say that in some ways he is a demon you know and so it's very on the nose it's very unsubtle but you know you have the kind of creepy monstrous imagery and it sort of shoehorned it's, it's shoehorned in to make the episode fit within an x-files construct and okay i mean i guess it works on that level too even if it's a bit on the nose, you know? Yeah. Now, I have no, I mean, you know, I, I will be looking forward to uh, the season six episode that you're talking about because I enjoyed, uh, I, I think Nick Chinland, I mean, he's a great villain. I'm going to say yeah. that right off. The, I mean, I, I think that he's my favorite villain since Toons. You know, I, yeah. I really, I think that uh, they knocked it out of the park, once again, casting an, in, an intriguing character actor who brings something special, something different, something unsettling. And there are a couple of things, though, because he's so just in-your-face creepy mm -hmm. <laughs> that you ask yourself, okay, there are people like the, you know, the prostitute that he murders is obviously very creeped out by him, Although not until she gets to his place. Before that, she's just looking at him as a traditional John, right? Yeah. But it begs the question that the company that hired him to be the delivery man, I mean, that woman doesn't find him creepy? That first day that he goes to the house to, you know, what, his first day on the yes. job, he goes oh, to that, God. He, he's acting... You know, it's it's the sort of thing where the guy, you know, he walks in. Not only is she all like, "Hey, how you doing?" You know, and and just, uh, "May I use your washroom?" And if that were me, I'm just like, uh, "No, you may not. There's the door. Please never come back here again." But not only does this woman say, "Go ahead and use my washroom," she's like, "Oh, by the way, uh, we leave the back door open all the time." <laughs> like. You are such a trustworthy person that I'm, I'm like, 
uh, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing about you that's uh, that's unusual or unsettling or creepy in any way. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you that we leave our back door open. You're welcome to come anytime when we're not home. You can come and wait for us. You, you <laughs> like, I I don't get it. I don't understand. I go like, because oh, his classmate, his classmate at that poetry class or whatever that is, uh, his classmate at night school is immediately unsettled by him as any normal person would be scully is unsettled by him he doesn't even open his mouth when, when she sees him in the in the jail cell right in the holding mm-hmm. cell so i go like all right why what, what's what what's wrong with these other people who don't immediately see that this man is this is not a good man <laughs> this is you know I, I don't this is not a normal dude all right I'm going to go off on a tangent here because it's related. Let's see. This would have been maybe 16 years ago. Um, my, my mother was still alive at that point, and I was living at home and working and going to school. Okay, so I would have been 20, 21, around there. Mm-hmm. And I was just chilling at the house. Um Cousins were in town for the summer, and my brother and I and one of my cousins decided that we were hungry. It was around lunchtime, so we were going to drive down the road to go to Subway real quick, pick up some sandwiches. We're talking a literally a three-minute drive one way, order it three minutes back. My parents were home at the time. I think my dad was in the bathroom having a bowel movement. Sorry, dad, if you're listening to this, but it's important for the explanation (laughs) anyway. (laughs) So we were gone for maybe 20 minutes tops, 25 at most. During that time, some guy probably in his late teens, early 20s had come up to the house. This is not a suburb. It's not quite the country, but it's it's somewhere in between. Come up to the house, rang the doorbell. My mother answered the door. He politely asked her if he could use the phone. She said yes. She lets him into the kitchen, does not know this person. And the door to the house opens onto the kitchen. But maybe two minutes later, while he's on the phone, she sees a sheriff's car pull up. And the cop gets out of the car, oh, comes up oh to my. the front door, and rings the doorbell. And he says, ma'am, have you seen anyone you have you seen any strangers walking around up here lately? And she says, well, I've just let a guy he's he's in in he's in here. He's using the telephone. He says, may I enter your home? And they end up arresting the guy in the kitchen. And my father comes out of the bathroom at this point to see some stranger being handcuffed (laughs) in his kitchen and has no idea what's going on. Turns out that the guy had beaten someone, not to death, but pretty severely, with a two-by-four about a half mile up the road. Oh, my God. And was calling a friend to come pick him up. (laughs) And the kicker to this is that the cop and the perpetrator were gone by the time I got back home in that 20-minute time span. (laughs) See, this happened while I was gone from the house. But my point is that... (laughs) Obviously, this was this was early 2000s, but I guess what I'm trying to say is the 90s were a different time, <laughs> especially <laughs> if you lived outside of the city or the suburbs. And I we would frequently be home and have the front door unlocked. Now, I don't do that now, and I've never done that since I've had my own home, but at the time, we did that a lot. So I don't know if my parents would ever get to the point where if they were having regular deliveries they would tell someone that a door was always unlocked but i can kind of see where this woman is coming from unfortunately (laughs) yes 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 well since you say it that way yeah i get it but you know to be fair to be fair to your mom uh, i i would imagine that the guy that came to the door perhaps didn't seem uh like a bad person one would hope not. <laughs> I, you know, I would imagine that she seemed like a perfectly normal person and very politely just asked to use the phone. I don't think he he had like had that sort of demeanor that is just <laughs> this man is a serial killer. Like I don't, you know, it's 
it's almost like Nick Chinland. And the thing is, again, like I think it's, he's a great villain because he's extremely oh, yeah. memorable and extremely creepy. But there's also a heightened level to his performance where he's almost very consciously going, yeah, I'm going to act exactly like every caricature of a serial killer yeah. that you've ever thought of. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. Right. Because the, the episode is a little pretentious in and again, kind of in your face with the whole, yes, this unassuming, anonymous boy next door, you know, and they, they show these pictures of him as a, as a kid. <laughs> and slowly, like, you see, like, the sort of, you know, as he's growing older and sort of cross blur into him is, like, sitting in his jail cell. But as they show those pictures of the kid, I'm like, that is one creepy fucking kid. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, like, not being subtle at all. That, that blank stare. Those like, <laughs> I just, I, I'm just like, I don't, you know, it's the sort of thing where you go like, well, it's those quiet ones. And I'm like, no, that's somebody that if, if that were my neighbor, it would not surprise me if I found out that, that, yeah, it turns out that guy was a serial killer. I'd be like, yeah, well, I kind of could, I could have told you that guy. <laughs> I mean, <it's> like, <laughs> like I, I grew up next door to him. I was not surprised one iota. And, and so, like, now, getting serious for a minute, it is interesting because, and this doesn't have anything to do uh, specifically with the episode, but there's the the graphic novel, which was turned into a film. I haven't seen the film. The graphic novel is terrific. And it's uh, done by Durf Backdurf, uh, my friend Dahmer. And I, I don't know if you've read it or you've heard of it, I would imagine. I've heard of it. I haven't seen the movie or read the comic, though, but I know what you're talking about. Right. Well, it's a terrific thing. And for the listeners who are not uh, familiar with it, just in case, uh, very quickly. So uh, ba Durf Backdurf, whose name I think is John Backdurf, actually, but he goes by the name of Durf Backdurf. Um, he's a cartoonist and eventually a graphic novel writer. And he actually grew up with Jeffrey Dahmer. Like he went to, he went to high school with Jeffrey Dahmer, right? And so what this, what this memoir is, is about his experiences in high school with Jeffrey Dahmer, right? And how, yeah, he was always a weird guy. You know, even back then he was a weird guy, but it's not the sort of thing where he turns out to be a serial killer and you go, oh, of course, that it's never really that simple. But it, but it was the sort of thing where you go through the whole memoir and in the introduction he talks about it and everything. And, you know, Backdurf is very much, he, he basically says, it's not that I knew it. It's, it's not that I could always tell. But when I found out what he had done and who, who he turned into, it made me reflect on our experiences. Right. And then when you reflect on it and you remember him in high school, you remember like hanging out with him and noticing strange behavior patterns and things like that. That's when you go, there was always something there, you know? Mm -hmm. But it, but it is in retrospect. It's not it's not something where it, you know while you're looking at the person. So again, I mean, if as you say, this is a small town. This is not a big urban center. This is a place where people are trustworthy enough to leave their back doors open for the delivery people to to come in. So yeah, I mean, I guess they could look at this guy and be like, eh, yeah, he seems perfectly normal. You know, he's he's just a good, he's just a a nice young man. Why not? You know, sure. Use my washroom and, and <laughs> if we're ever if we're ever not home, just just come on over and bring the bring the groceries in and help yourself to anything you want and watch some TV. <laughs> sit down, like sit in our living room, watch some TV, help yourself to a sandwich. You know, <laughs> I don't, it, it's it's so strange. It's so strange to me. I I didn't think about it until now, but. You were mentioning the family photos of Donnie when he was little, and he had multiple sisters, only yeah. boy child. Mm -hmm. Back to Aubrey, that was also the case with Coakley. He had all sisters growing up. Of course, in that situation, it said that no matter what child did something wrong, because the father would never raise a hand to a woman, Coakley is the one who got beat Mm -hmm. So if sister number one broke a vase, Coakley got beat for it. If sister number two put a dent in the car, Coakley is the one who got beat for it. Mm -hmm. Hence his, someone's got to pay little sister and it's not going to be me. Right. 
So, and they never talk about child abuse with Donnie, but I find it interesting that not only do we get back-to-back Millennium-style serial killer episodes, but we get back-to-back ones where there is a serial killer present who was the only boy raised in a large family with siblings who were all sisters. Yeah. Just kind of interesting. And I did look it up. The All of the episodes this season aired in the production order that they were made. So they hmm. did intend these to be back-to-back for whatever reason. Yeah, well, then, I mean, I would think that in that case, it's absolutely deliberate. I mean... Yeah, it has to be. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, because you... You don't do that by accident. You don't. You don't go like, well, here we've got these two stories that are so very similar, and oh, well, what a coincidence that we happen to just uh, that we're going to be airing them back to back. No, you do that on purpose, and and it makes me wonder what the game plan was at this point because I don't know because we're ninety four now. Bringing we're not we're ninety five actually. We're early. Oh, we're ninety five now. Okay, we're, we're early in 95. early ninety five. So. Millennium ends up premiering in 96. So I'm wondering if this was some sort of in-narrative backdoor pitch to the network. Like, we want to do this other show, and instead of Chris Carter walking in and saying, here's what I want to do, he just says, watch these two episodes. Let's do nothing, well, almost nothing but stories like this, but with a new set of characters as another series. Like, that's the only thing I can think of that would make sense as to why you would place them back to back in the airing order. Yeah, that makes sense. Because if, if, okay, so Millennium premiered not during the second season, but I guess after the third season. Yeah, I believe so. Right. If, if that, if this is where we're going. So that would mean, that would make sense because it would mean that it went into production probably late in 95 or very early in 96. But within a year of this episode airing, Millennium was definitely at least in production. You know, I would think. It says the uh, the show premiered October 25th, 1996. So they definitely would have had the wheels in motion for it at this point, at yeah. least to some degree. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I, I think that in your, your theory makes sense your theory theory makes sense where where basically maybe the show has already been pitched to the network Mm -hmm. and the network is you know well you know we they maybe they they like the idea of the whole backdoor pilot thing but even though millennium is a spin-off of the x-files it's not a direct thing it's not like it has any characters that carry over it's like in the same world in a way but it's not it is its own thing, right? And yeah, so maybe that's why they said, well, right. You can't do like a backdoor pilot where you've got like, at least maybe maybe they could have, but they didn't think of it that way. Yeah. And so what, what he said instead was, well, instead of doing a backdoor pilot, what we could do is a proof of concept. Yeah. And we could basically show you within the X-Files what we're sort of aiming for, the kind of tone we're aiming for, the kind of stories we're aiming for. This is what we're going to do. So that, that's a very good theory. Because this will happen again, I imagine. There, there will be other episodes about serial killers. But as we were saying in the previous episode, it seems to me that once Millennium premiered, since they already had that outlet for those kinds of stories, they said, all right, I think we'll just let Millennium handle that stuff and we'll continue doing our thing here on the X-Files, which is very different from that. Because Millennium had a lot, many of the same creative people involved, mm-hmm. right, behind yeah. the scenes, I believe. Carter and Morgan and Wong, specifically. Yeah, exactly. So it stands to reason that it was like, all right, yeah, this is how we'll scratch that itch. And we'll let X-Files be the, the one that handles monsters and, and that sort of thing, you know. So that's, um, yeah, it, it makes sense that these were like a proof of concept, a, a deliberate proof of concept for Millennium. Great acting, uh, oh, yeah. I will say. But besides, besides uh, Nick Chinland, who's who's extremely, extremely memorably creepy, Gillian Anderson does some great work here. I mean, uh, she really, yes. she really conveys that. She really conveys that. And whether it was in the script form or whether it was shot that way or whatever it is, I'm sure that she was privy to the first draft of the script. Oh, had to be. 
So clearly she used that. Clearly she was like, look, independent of what we're actually doing because of standards and practices, I'm going to play it like this because I think that works better for the scenes and it works better for the just for me to be able to dramatize it better. So she played it as if you were a necrophilia. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because the, 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 her, the way she expresses disgust and all of that, it's, uh, there's two interesting things about that. She tells the therapist that she doesn't want Mulder to know how badly this is affecting her, mm-hmm. right? But of course he knows, he can yeah. tell. He can tell from the, from the minute one. He's like, he knows this is bothering her and he keeps on trying to give her an out. He's like, look, it's fine. It's totally okay. I get it. Heavy cases like this, they're not for everyone. Some people can't take them. You have nothing to be ashamed of, but she still won't, you know, she won't give in. She won't, um, she won't take his out until the end when she finally breaks down, when she, she just can't take it anymore at yeah. that point. And it's probably the, the rawest we've seen her. Oh, definitely. Emotionally speaking, at least. Which makes for a good juxtaposition because Mulder is very calm and collected throughout the entire episode. He's just fully back in his old FBI profiler mode here. Just running down the checklist of everything that he needs to do, you know, to stop these killings before they get even worse. Which, in turn shows why he's not as bothered by everything because you know before the x-files this was his field this is the kind of stuff he would have been out doing as yeah, his a profile fbi agent yeah yeah because that was his specialty right he's a profiler so yep this is what he would have been doing like day in day out uh that is you know there's opportunity for some nice dark comedy you know because when they, when they first get to that cemetery and uh, you got that other cop. That's a great character, too. Like, I, oh, yeah, I was, I was yeah. going to bring him up. Yeah, yeah he's, yeah, that, he's yeah. just quirky and fun. Yeah, he's, he's a great character. Like, he's, he's, really, he's really a lot of fun. He's just convinced that this is the work of aliens. And, and Mulder is like, nope, this is nothing here suggests that this is the work of aliens. Nothing. And then when he's back in the car with Scully, and she's like, well, then why did we come down here? And he, oh, and he takes out two tickets to the game. <laughs> you know, that was like, that was really the funny. look on her face. Yeah, and she's just sort of sitting there going, like, really? That's okay. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my point is, at that point, at that point, Mulder seems genuinely not bothered by it. You know, in the sense that he's almost like, yeah, this is a waste of our time. Like, we're gonna go watch the game and go home and whatever. We only came down here as an excuse to do that. Like, that's really why we're here. So do you think at that point he just doesn't see the seriousness of the situation at all? I don't think he's worried about it until the second body shows up when they end up missing the game. Yeah, I don't I don't think he's all that bothered by any of it at all until that point, because I guess. In his view, if it's just a singular incident, it could be something else somebody looking for something, some sort of revenge thing to piss off that particular family. There's a couple of other reasons for why someone might do something that awful, you know, as digging up a corpse and, you know, desecrating the grave. But once right. that second body shows up with the exact same stuff, then he the, the switch flips and he's right back over into profile and mode. Right. You know, just going, all right, we need to find this guy before he actually kills someone, because that's going to be his next step. Right. It's it's like the warning bells go off, because before that, yeah, at first he thinks it could just be an isolated incident. Mm -hmm. And in his head, he's thinking. And at the end of the day, okay, it's it's some weird dude who's defiling corpses. Certainly not normal behavior, certainly not good behavior, but I'm not going to worry about this. You know, uh, this this doesn't seem to be a killer. It just seems to be a weird dude. Uh, it only comes later when he says, well, this guy could turn out to be a killer. So yeah, that, then then you have to worry. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, Agent Mo is a fun sidekick for the episode because you can tell this guy's been in the Bureau for a long time. He's been stationed at this field office forever. And from the looks of things, he never gets a case that's out of the ordinary. So 
when he's talking yeah. about aliens in the cemetery, he's excited and hoping that it actually is aliens. You can see yeah. the look on his face. Yeah, and he... even when it just turns out to be someone as awful and weird as Donnie, he's taking the case seriously and he wants to solve it and he wants to stop him. But you can also see that his eyes are lit up, like he's finally awake again as an agent instead of just someone taking calls in the office and, you know, looking into the occasional post office threat or who knows what else that might come across his desk. Yeah, I like that character's kind of combination of um, small town naivete and street smart, yeah. like at demeanor. You know, he has that kind of gruff voice and he kind of carries himself a certain way. And I like how he seems to be a bit of a dumb dumb in a certain way. But no, he's actually very intelligent because he, he's able to discuss motivations and yeah. the psychological profile of the killer in a very sort of even at, uh, on even footing with Mulder. He, he has serious discussions about it, has insight into it, and the things he says make sense. Yeah, I think at the beginning he's having to flex muscles, on-the-job muscles that he hasn't used in a very long time. And I guess one one interesting thing about Nick Chilmond is, for anyone that has seen him in a lot of stuff, and he is very much one of those that-guy actors, sure. typically when he is playing a villain, he is chewing scenery left and right and really over-the-top, loud and boisterous. And here, even though he is leaning into a lot of serial killer cliches and just whipping them up into a strange cocktail, he's very still very much underplaying the role in terms of how he plays everything else. It's very understated. He's very quiet, which isn't really typical for a normal Chinlin villainous role. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, as I said at the top, it's a great performance. Oh, yeah. It's a great performance because it's very measured. It's very... He, he does walk that fine line between it being slightly caricatured, slightly mm -hmm. heightened, slightly heightened. However just on the right side of believable. Yeah. Where, yeah, he's dialing it up a tad, but on the level where you you know you've seen people like this. Yeah. You know, like, it. there is a certain theatricality to it, but there's also a genuinely creepy element to it where you know mm -hmm. that this is believable. And you know you've, you've seen people like this, and people like this scare the shit out of you. And and he he manages to do that. He manages to be genuinely, genuinely frightening. Yeah. And, yeah, it's the episode is very successful because of that. The conquest of fear lies in the moment of its acceptance. And understanding what scares us most is that which is most familiar, most commonplace. That boy next door, Donnie Faster, the unremarkable younger brother of four older sisters, extraordinary only in his ordinariness, could grow up to be the devil in a button-down shirt. It's been said that the fear of the unknown is an irrational response to the excesses of the imagination. But our fear of the everyday, of the lurking stranger, and the sound of footfalls on the stairs, the fear of violent death and the primitive impulse to survive, are as frightening as any X-File, as real as the acceptance that it could happen to you. That is that. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. And if you did enjoy it, there are many ways you can support the podcast, which is available on Anchor FM, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other platforms. You can subscribe. You can rate and or review it, depending on what platform you're enjoying it on. And of course, you can share and spread the word on social media. Please do any or all of these things. Every little bit helps. Look for the Eric Santuan Network on Facebook or on YouTube. You can also follow me on Twitter at Eric's Antoine Net and check out my film reviews on Letterboxd. You should also check out Daniel Baldwin's website, theschlocketeer.com, and follow him on Twitter at Daniel W. Baldwin. I'm Eric's Antoine, and I'll be back in a couple of days to discuss Die Hand Die Verletzt, which is German for The Hand. The. Well, no, but if you listen to my Simpsons podcast, you probably get that joke. And even if you don't get the joke, I hope you'll join me next week anyway, 
when I'll be sitting down to discuss that creepy episode with the Penske Files' Clay McCormick. And until then, please remember that the truth is out there. See you next time.